right. Well, today we're going to dive into the light and darkness study. Yeah. So we have been studying with Franco. And Franco, we did Seeking God with Franco. He's fired up. Uh, he's been going after God with his whole heart. Having great quiet times, digging into the book of John, one chapter a day, answering the four questions. He went and got himself a really sweet uh, uh, leather journal. He wow. just sold out. He just sold out. Wow. Wow. Uh, oh, okay. um, we then did the Word of God study, which just made him even more excited to dig into the Word of God because he's just got a deep conviction that the Bible is actually God's inspired word. Amen. And the implications, if he believes that the Bible's the word of God, he better doggone know it and do it, right? And that's what he feels. Then we did the discipleship study, and this shook him a bit, because growing up religious, he was thinking that everything was fine. He was living the life that God wanted him to live and, and doing all the things that God wanted him to do. And he never really studied out what Jesus said it meant to actually follow him. Wow. Literally from the words of Jesus. And it blew his mind and he's like, man, i got to do this. I've got to do this. Then we went on and told him, we did the persecution study. We said, hey, look, this is controversial. You start messing with people and showing them from the Bible that they really need to actually follow God and they can't just get a get out of hell free card and do whatever you want to do because you believe in Jesus or grandma's a Christian and you all of a sudden got the got the the, the, the Christian gene or whatever oh, no not but you actually have you got to make the decision you got to follow Jesus that you're gonna get some persecution yeah, yeah. And so he's like man that's tough but uh, I'm ready for it that's tough. Uh, I'm ready for it wow and we got into the kingdom stuff this one he had to wrestle with a little bit because he has a night job. And he's got to make a decision. He had to make a decision of, was he going to go talk to his boss about getting evenings off so he could come to the kingdom, come to meetings yeah, of the body? And we had to pray together and show him some other scriptures. And finally, he, had, he got enough faith to be able to call his boss. And his boss said, cool, no problem. We'll work with you. Just tell us when you can work. And he was excited. He just built his faith, which is awesome. Now we're going to get into the light and darkness study, which really should be the darkness and the light study, uh, because we're going to start talking about what it means to be saved. Mm. How does somebody get saved? We know from Matthew 28 that we got to go and make disciples. Right. Yeah. We know that a disciple is a candidate for baptism. Right. So if somebody's not a disciple and they get baptized, and I'll share about that a little bit in my own life, then guess what? That baptism didn't do diddly squat. And they just got wet. Which happened to me at 13. Again, I'll get into that in study. I'll talk all about that and talk all about that. So how does one go from being in the darkness to being in the light of God? Let's look at our first passage, 1 Peter chapter 2. And of course, we're going to pray before the study. That's imperative, right? And then we're going to go on and, uh, you know, every person who's in that study is going to read a particular passage, right? And we're going to read it as if it's we're reading the actual words of Jesus, which is what we're doing. Uh, and we're going to have deep conviction. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2. We should be able to zip through the study pretty quickly today. Although it does take a little bit longer. The kingdom study is a little longer uh, because there's a little bit, and it's a little bit more teachy. Uh, the light and darkness study, as you'll find, is a little bit longer, not because of how many scriptures are in it, but really because it's an opportunity for us to get to know each other quite a bit better. And uh, you, if you guys have done the study, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but we will get into that here in just a little bit. So. 1 Peter, chapter 2, look here in verse 9. Bible says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, Franco, what we've got here is a bit of a compare and contract. Right? Of course, I'm going to pause and ask Franco, hey, so what do you get? What stands out to you in this passage? Right? And while he's sharing with me, I'm going to write this down. So we've got darkness. We have not a people. And we have no mercy. We have light. Wonderful light, he says, right? Yeah. A people of God. And we have mercy. Now, under the darkness piece, this person is lost. This person is not a Christian. And they're not a disciple. And of course, we know that a disciple and a Christian biblically are the same thing, even though our religious world would say a Christian is kind of like just a believer and, and the disciples are, they're hardcore. They're hardcore. Biblically speaking, there is no difference between somebody who's a Christian and a disciple. We already know that. So on this side, we have saved a Christian, a disciple. All right? Now, Franco, what's interesting about this passage is, does it talk anywhere about there being a gray area? between darkness and light. No, not at all. So, you know, I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine the other day, and he was talking to me about his faith, and he's like, hey, you guys are studying the Bible with me, and it's awesome, and I feel like I'm in this tunnel, and there's light at the end, and as I walk, I'm walking this tunnel, I'm going closer and closer, it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter. Is that what the Bible says is happening as you are growing and learning more and more about being a disciple? No. You're either in the dark or you're in the light. There's no twilight zone in Christianity. Right. You're either saved or you're lost. There's no such thing as kind of saved, kind of lost. Mm, yeah. Right Now, we are making, you know, uh, frankly, you are making a journey, but let me ask you, where are you at today? Well, I think it's obvious. Right. I'm still in the dark. I'm still lost. I, I'm learning how to be a disciple, but I'm not there yet. Exactly. Exactly. Now, remember, Franco, I preached on this last week. Sometimes you got to hear the bad news before you can really, really understand the good news. And so that's what we're going to get into. We're going to get into the bad news right now. We're going to get into the darkness. All right? Let's go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. This is a funny passage to me. It gives me a really interesting visual. Oh, well, those of you that have done the Mike Narcos study with me have heard it. Isaiah 59, look here in verse 1. It says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your gods. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Now, what do you take away from this passage, Franco? Well, it says God's basically not too weak to save me, but that my iniquities, I don't even know what that is. What, what's an iniquity? Well, iniquity is just another layer of sin. Right. It's another type of sin, but sin in general. Yeah, so my, my sins have, have hidden his face from me so that he won't hear. Exactly. See, oftentimes, Franco, a lot of people think that, that, that God left them. That somehow God is like, you're too sinful, you're too dirty, you're too nasty, I'm out of here. Is that true? No. We already looked at that in Acts 17, remember, where it says, in him we live and move and have our being, mm. right? Yeah. He's right there. In mm. fact, he's orchestrating, he's so close to you, that he's orchestrating the little tiny things in your life so that you will have a relationship with him. Mm. But what did we do, does this pastor say? 
This says that we are the ones that pushed away from God because of our sin. Right. We said, God, no, I want this, not you, bye. And we stiff on God. Mm, and we kept pushing him away and pushing him away and pushing him away because of our sin. The visual that I get here is like a Tyrannosaurus Rex with those really, really small arms. Really powerful being, but such small arms that are weak, they are ridiculous, right? That's what I get here, right? Surely the Lord's not too short. This is God. This is the Lord. This is the most powerful being ever. And yet he's got these like little, tiny, dinky, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex arms. No. We pushed ourselves away from God. Because of our sin. Right. So this is what this looks like, Franco. This is what it looks like. So we have we have God and we have light. And we have man and we have darkness. And what's separating the light from the darkness, from God and man, is this wall of sin. Mm. Does that make sense, Franco? Yeah, it totally makes yeah. sense. So sin is what separates us from God. For a man to have a relationship with God, we have to deal with this wall. We have to deal with this wall. At the point in time that this wall is gone, we could say that now... The light has flooded the whole room, and that person goes from being in the dark to being in the light, meaning they go from being lost to being saved. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you agree with that, Franco? Yeah. Now, here's the problem. Most people see this, and they, they can understand, yeah, I've done really bad things in my life, and so what do they do? They grab a pickaxe, and they start trying to chop and chop and chop with all their good deeds. They keep trying to chop down this, this wall of sin, and they're making some good headway. Right? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sleeping with my girlfriend. I'm going to stop cursing. I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to start reading the Bible. I'm going to start paying my taxes. I'm going to start doing the right things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop doing the wrong things. And so I keep chipping away with these good things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Now, that might work on some level. But here's the problem. For every one that you chop off, we sin every day, another one pops right back on. Wow. Yeah. Am I right? That's yeah. true. No matter how good we might think we are, no matter how many good deeds we might think we are doing, we still sin every single day. Wow. Yeah. And so there's just no possible way. A, we started too late, trying to hack the wall down. Now it's way too big. And B, there's no way we can chop it down fast enough that the new sins don't pile up. Mm -hmm. So we can't buy our good deeds. No, bro. Secondly, once it's gone, let's say, for the sake of argument at this moment, that it could just be gone in a poof. Mm -hmm. Because I still sin every day, I'm still piling up bricks on this wall. Right. So there has to be a way, Franco, mm -hmm. not only for the wall to be completely gone, to start fresh, if you will, to start over, a clean slate, right? But there has to be a way, not only to eliminate the wall itself, but to make sure that wall never, ever, ever shows up again. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, that's the time when somebody actually gets saved. They go from the light, or the darkness, to the light. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. The point in time that mm -hmm. sin is forgiven is the point in time that that person is saved. Does that make sense, Franco? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, let's keep going. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. And by the way, Franco, we're going to get into both of those things. How do we get out of this sin? How do we break down that wall? How do we annihilate that wall once and for all? And how do we keep the bricks from being stacked? We're going to get into both of those. Romans chapter 3. Read here in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. 
God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Okay, what do you take away from this? Well, it says all have sinned. Yeah, it says everyone has sinned. So, let's take a look at it this way, frankly. We've got Enrico. And he, you know, lived a pretty decent life. Not too terribly bad. You know what I mean? Maybe he stole a pack of bubble gum when he was six. You know what I mean? But not too terribly bad. Then you've got Mike. Oh, now Mike, a uh, bit of a partier back in the day. You know what I mean? Kind of had to sow his wild oats. You know what I'm saying? And I typically do make fun of the guys in my. Not, not that you know this is their real sins or anything like that, but I do typically, oh, you know, just for levity, kind of make fun of a couple guys. And come on. And then there's, then there's me. Mm. Boy, I can tell you horror stories about the kind of sin that I make. They will. Wow. Right. Now, let me ask you, Franco. Who's farther from God? Well, obviously you do. I mean, that's a big pile of sin. It's true. But what does the Bible say? Mm. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of glory of God. So in reality, all of us, before we encounter what we're going to talk about today in the study, all of us were just as far away from God as any of the others. Now, to be true, Different sins have different consequences, but God sees all sin the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. From the worst person you could possibly imagine, maybe it's Hitler, Jeffrey Dahmer, mm -hmm. whoever you can think of, the worst human being imaginable, to Grandma Edna that did not do anything wrong, uh -huh. the Bible says, God says, all have sinned right. and are equally separated from God. But it also says that all of them are equally justified by faith in his blood. Mm. How encouraging is that? And that's because God doesn't see sin the way that man sees sin. God is looking down from heaven and he, sins, he sees sin like this. So even though from the side, that pile looks, whoa, this is huge. God sees it. And obviously my drawing isn't to scale, but he sees it the same. So everyone is sinned. Right. Everybody is just as far away from God as anybody else. Mm. And Enrico, with his good deeds, mm. is just as far away from God as me with my bad deeds. Mm. So let's talk about sin. What is sin? Now this is really cool. Because before I started studying Bible, I thought, hey, uh, I only slept with girls that I love. Um, I didn't murder anybody. I'm not raping anybody. I uh, only lie when it's important. Um, and I speak. So I guess I'm okay. Well, the Bible actually talks a lot about sin. Which is awesome. Because we now know what God's going to hold us accountable to. Let's start with Galatians chapter 5. Come on, bro. Now, Franco, there are really two types of sins that the Bible classifies. What is called the sins of commission. These are sins that we commit, we do. And sins of omission, these are things that we omit or don't do. And we're going to look at some passages on all of them. And just so that you know, uh, I'm going to add one scripture to this, and I'm also going to add a couple more for the way that I do the study that's a little bit different than what's in the book, okay? So... We'll go to Galatians. God eats popcorn. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians chapter 5. Let's look here starting in verse 19. The Bible says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, that's quite a list, wouldn't you see there? 
Yeah, Eric, that's, uh, that's some nastiness right there. Absolutely. Uh, we'll come back to this in a minute, but let's head on over to another passage, uh, and let's go to Timothy, 2 Timothy. So if you want, you can put your, if you've got a ribbon, you can put your ribbon there in Galatians 5. We'll come back to that. But we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is what I typically do is we just hop into these passages. We'll go back into Galatians and walk through Galatians specifically. Amen? Amen so 2 Timothy chapter 3, look here in verse 1. It says, the Bible says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. <laughs> now Galatians 5 was a lot of external sins. These are still sins of commission, but these are sins of the heart. These are deep. When somebody is rash, when somebody is conceited, when somebody is abusive, proud, boastful, lovers of themselves, these are deep-rooted heart sins. They can be seen externally. They manifest themselves in many of the sins that we just looked at in Galatians 5, but this is a little bit deeper. Now, this is just two. There's quite a few other sin lists in the Bible. You can Google that on your own. But these are the two that really kind of encompass probably the two major lists in the scriptures. Sins of commission. Now let's look at sins of omission. Go to James chapter 4. Come on, bro. James chapter 4. Look here in verse 17. James 4, 17, it says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Wow. So if you don't do something that you know you should do, that's sin. You're in sin. I know that I need to say I love you to my wife, and I don't. I'm in sin. I know I need to hug my kids, and I don't. I'm in sin. I mean, this just covers all of it, right? Like, this is, we're done. I'm done, okay? Right, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay? So, when you know the good you ought to do, right, but what about when you knew that you should be having quiet times in the morning and spending time with God in prayer and Bible study that you weren't? That's sin, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's look at one more. Let's go to Romans chapter 14. This is a really good one for the religious people amongst us. You know what I mean? For the religious people that we study the Bible. Romans 14. Look here at the end of verse 23. Romans 14, verse 23. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat. Because their eating is not from faith. So let me give you a quick little synopsis of what this means. The whole chapter 14, you had people in the, Roman, in, the, in the church in Rome who were eating food that was sacrificed to idols. And you had some people in the church who were like, that's an idol, that's just a block of wood, that's just a piece of metal. Like, that means nothing to me. And if this food was sacrificed to them, who cares? Because they're nothing, they're nothing, they're nothing. So I'm just going to eat it, not cool with that. But you had other people who had softer consciences and they were like, yeah, but that's an idol of worship. I can't, you know, I just... And so they would come together, and people would be bringing these food, and they would say, yeah, it was sacrificed to an idol, but you should just eat it anyway. And they're like, oh, okay, all right. And they would eat it. And what they would be eating is condemnation upon themselves because they weren't doing it with faith. Mm. They were violating their conscience. And so Paul writes to the Romans and said, no, 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 no. If you've got somebody who's conscience is stricken about this, then you need to just not eat. Don't eat that food. Go home and eat. But you need to care about your brother and sister enough to go, hey, I'm not going to make this person strong. But then he turns the tables on the person who's saying all these things. Because some of them were giving into, well, I guess it's okay. 
which it was, but they weren't doing it in faith. Mm -hmm. oh, no. And so he says at the end, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Wow. So if you don't make a decision based on faith, mm -hmm. it's sin. So Franco, remember we talked about this, about you going and talking to your boss and having that conversation? Yeah, man. I was freaked out. Yeah, man. Totally understandable. Totally understandable. No judgment here. But what did you lack? I lacked faith. Yeah, because you were worried, right? Yeah. So that was sin. Wow. Yeah. Man, bro. Let's go back to Galatians 5. Back to Galatians 5. And let's dive into this. Again, what I typically do is I walk through all four of these and then we hop right back to Galatians 5. And then we dig in to what this is. Okay. Come on, bro. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. And I simply just walk through each one of these and give a little bit of a definition. So sexual morality. Sexual morality is sex outside of marriage. You could be single and they could be married. They could be married and you could be single. You both could be single. You both could be married. Sex outside of the marriage covenant. Does that make sense? Okay. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Now automatically and obviously when we talk about impurity, we are talking about physical impurity for sure. Pornography, masturbation, uh, talking about other various non-sexual intercourse activities. Mm -hmm. right? We're going to get real real here. That's what the Bible says. Amen? Uh, no, but it also is impure motives. Mm -hmm. Anything that defiles you. Your conscience. Right? That was one of the issues that they were dealing with there in Romans 14. Was They, were, they, had, they had impurity because they, they were violating their consciences. Right? So there's impurity on that side too. Debauchery. Anybody know what debauchery is? I don't know that anybody that I've ever studied with knew what debauchery was. I for sure did not know what it was when I first studied. It's an overindulgence. Overworking, overeating, oversleeping, playing too many video games, watching too much Netflix, too much uh, uh, even good things. Workaholism, alcoholism, right? Overindulgence in the senses. Okay? That's oh, debauchery. Good. Idolatry, putting anything and everything that's above God. Mm. If any, if, it's okay to idolize God. That's not idolatry, that's just called good worship. Mm. Amen? Amen? But when you put something above God, that is idolatry. Right. Women, men, money, status, cars, you name it, whatever it is. Witchcraft. Now this obviously is the what it is, witchcraft, so Ouija boards, seances, you know, magic, Wiccan, you know, all these kind of things. Um, I, I would, you know, depending on who you're studying with, I would say like Dungeons and Dragons and some of these things. Although on some level that can be like a regular board game. It just mm -hmm. kind of depends on how deep they're into it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but this is also uh, illicit drugs, right? The word, root word here in the Greek is pharmaceia which is where we get our word pharmacy from. So this is uh, uh, smoking weed, this is you know, cocaine, this is, again, illicit drugs. Yeah. Right, well, well, but I thought that uh, uh, marijuana is legal now. Uh -huh. So that, no. <laughs> Another way to put this is anything that alters your state of mind. Mm -hmm. So what about tobacco smoke or chewing tobacco? Well, why do you need that? Well, I typically smoke when I'm stressed. Yeah. So that means instead of going to God, you're going to a substance. Oh, yeah. Oh, bro. Yeah. yeah. I knew a guy um, who would smoke weed uh, in order to, or marijuana, in order to be more creative. And he claimed to be a Christian. And I said, bro, why don't you just tap into the Holy Spirit? Why do you need this extra, like, you know, experience mm -hmm. in order to be creative? Okay. Just tap into the Holy Spirit. That is sin. It's called witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Anything that alters your state of mind. 
hatred, hatred, very self-explanatory. Discord, discord is a musical term, and it means if you strum a guitar or play a chord on um, on the piano or something, everything should sound melodic. All the things should 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 all the chords should be ringing together true. But discord is when one of those strings is out of tune. Does that make sense? Okay. So if Mike is saying, hey, Eric, uh, this is an awesome study. Uh, could we go over this again with just the brothers? And Malik, for whatever reason, is like, nah, dude. You Yet all the other brothers are like unified, like, yeah, this is awesome. Let's get together. Let's study. This is great. And Malik's just like, back, back. <laughs> now, obviously, Malik doesn't do that. But so, it's intentional division, causing mm -hmm. discord, disharmony, okay? Then you've got jealousy. Now, jealousy and envy, which is later in the verse, can, we might, you know, sometimes we get them mixed up. Jealousy is possessive. That is my car, that is my wife, that is my money, that is mine, and I'm unwilling to share. God says, I am a jealous God. God has the right to say that. Yeah, right? I can be jealous of my wife. Why? Because she's mine. And my wife can be jealous of me. Why? Because I'm hers. Right? But if I have money and I know it's the right thing to share that, no, this is mine. This is mine. Right? It's possessive. I own this and I'm unwilling to. Fits of rage, this is anger out of control. <coughs> Selfish ambition, ambition is good. Ambition is good, I'm gonna write a book on it. Probably in the next couple years. Ambition is good. But selfish ambition is wrong. Stepping on people's toes in order to get, right? You're, you're climbing the corporate ladder or you're trying to get what you want and you're willing to do anything and everything in order to get what you want, including sin. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Dissension is causing division. So again, back to the scenario, right? Mike's like, "Hey, man, let's get together." And uh, uh, and Malik's like, going to Enrico and says, "Hey, man, Mike wants to get together. Like, geez, we just spent an hour walking through this study with Eric already. Like, you know, like, is that even cool?" And Enrico's like, "Yeah, man, this is awesome. I'm excited." It's like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he goes to Frankie. Frankie, like, this is kind of lame. Mike, I don't know what he's talking about. And Frankie's like, yeah, man, I got work. Yeah, man, like, Eric's not even considering any of this. And what is he doing? He's causing division. No, again, Malik wouldn't do any of this. But it's a nice enough. Yeah. Factions. So you go from being dis having discord to dissensions, and then you quickly find yourself in factions. This is all the isms. We live in probably one of the most uh, fractured societies that, I, that I've ever lived in to date. And this is racism, classism, sexism, any of the isms, any of the, your group is worse than my, my group is better. Black is better than white. Uh, 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 Toyota is better than Ford. Right? I mean, it can't get that petty. <laughs> right? But it's, it's when, when your group is inferior to my group. That is a faction. That is a faction. And that is sin. Envy. Now, envy, again, jealousy is possessive. Envy is I want what they want or what they have. Yeah. Okay? It's envy. Drunkenness, uh, contrary to what many people say, it is not a sin to drink alcohol. However, it is a sin to get drunk. Yes, getting buzzed is getting drunk. It alters your state of mind, you're on the border of witchcraft there anyway. This is why at the end it says, and the like, okay? So drunkenness, orgies. Now with orgies, some people automatically go to sexual orgies, but orgies is just a flowery word for group sin. Group sin. Eric, I love going to the club. Cool, you go to the 
the club to hook up and to sin. Don't, I don't, there is nobody on God's green earth that can actually look me in the face and I will believe them when they say, I just love to dance, so I just go to the club. No. No. Ain't nobody go to the club just to dance. Mm. Period. You want to go dance? There's a bunch of dance studios that you could go to that don't have uh, 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 alcohol, that don't have drugs, that don't have scantily clad men or women. Yeah. Why do you got to go to a club? Group sin, bars, clubs, in various kinds. That's, that, is, on, bro. that is group sin, that is an orgy. Uh, one time, my brother, uh, we were both going to a Christian school. Of course, this would happen at a Christian school. And uh, this one guy named Josh Reeders, I still remember his name, Josh Reeders. Wow. He tried to run against me for student council president, and he got in trouble because it was a Christian school. And he used a euphemism in his post. He said, oh my gosh, vote for Josh. Which I thought was really cool. Like, that's awesome. But he's like, you can't put that up there. That's a euphemism. Which is like a word that you use instead of a cuss word. Oh my gosh. Anyway, I beat him hands down. It was no even contest. Anyway, I had a buddy of mine play. He played the piccolo, uh, the piccolo um, trumpet. And I had him, he, hit, he wanted to play uh, with the presidential fanfare. And so before I went up to get my speech, he stood up, he was in the back of the room. He didn't, nobody knew this, and he got up. Anyway, so Josh Reeves. Josh Reeves and my brother did not have a good relationship. And so one time, my, my brother called Josh Reeves out. What did you do when you get called out? You gotta say yes, man. And so we all went up on top of the hill where the track was. We went up on top of the hill. And everybody circled up. Josh Reekers was there. He didn't know. I was on my way. Oh. I saunter up there. Oh. And he's like, my beef's not with you, man. My beef's not with you. I was like, your beef's with my brother. Your beef's with me. My beef's not with you, man. Because he knew I would just take him out. Oh. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the, the, the bigger twin. You know? Oh, man. <laughs> the scrappier twin. Oh, oh. You might want to check out the movie Twins. It's a really good one. Oh. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Danny DeVito, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but, so, so my brother gets up there, and my brother ends up taking him out anyway. Wow. But everybody's like, fight, fight. Kind of classic what you would find in the movie. Fight, fight. Guess what? Orgy group sit. Yeah. Group sit. Yeah. yeah, right? And by the way, all these stories are the stories that I share in the LED study. So, uh, anyway, you know, it just kind of it helps to, to put uh, words in stories, right? And it says, and the like, meaning anything that's like these. Mm. Well, my particular sin isn't in the Bible. Mm. Uh, it probably is with and the like. <laughs> you are selfishly ambitious, so therefore you are discordish. And because you don't get your way, uh, you go into a fits of rage and you get drunk. And the like. Does that make sense? Now, here's the encouraging thing, Frank, Franco. He says, I warn you as I did before that those who what? Live like this. Which means, if you stop living like this, you can enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, right? So, what we typically do at this point, in most of the studies that we've uh, learned, is we typically go around, and the people in the study will share a little bit about what were the things in this list that they really struggled with before becoming a disciple? Now, I have always felt that that was awkward. Because you just kind of hop right into it. But I find it a little easier because the Bible actually, what we're asking them to do and what we're doing is really modeling what the Bible says. Let's go to James chapter 5. And so I go to these passages. Because remember, what we're trying to do, and I wish I still had it up here, we've got that wall of sin, right? And what we're trying to do is, one, get rid of that wall of sin completely, period, done, gone. But number two, we've got to talk about how do I keep that wall from ever coming back? This is one of the things that we do to keep 
that wall from coming back. John, or James chapter 4, or uh, 5, excuse me, James chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible says, Five sixteen. Here we go. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So, Franco, what does this say? What well, says we should confess our sins to one another? So that what? So we can pray for each other and so that you can find healing. Absolutely. Do we confess for salvation? No. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you confess for salvation, contrary to what the Catholic Church teaches. You, the, the Catholic Church teaches this. That this is the priest, and there's a little tiny window right here. And you're right here. And so every time you go to the confessional, the priest will open the window, take your confession, so you get a little bit of light, and then close it. Is that going to work? No. You've got to get rid of the wall. A man cannot get rid of the wall for you. But we do confess. This is a command of God. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Most of the world's ills are because we've sinned grievously and we are holding that in. I can't tell you how therapeutic. There was one particular sin. I won't talk about it here. There was one particular sin that I committed that I told myself, I'm taking this to the grave. Mm -hmm. To the grave. I ain't telling nobody. Mm -hmm. And I had to make a choice when I sat down from this passage. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I got to share this. Mm -hmm. And I shared it. And boy, I tell you what, I wasn't even saved yet, but I felt like I was on cloud nine. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And there was so much healing that came from just getting that out. Open about something. No, bro. Amen? Amen. So Amen. it says to confess our sins to one Let's go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. And again, folks, I think it's very important that we teach this. Mm -hmm. We don't get open with one another just because the pastor says to do it, but because the because God says it. Uh, and if God says that there's a reason for it, and it's a good reason. First John chapter 1. Look here at verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, check this out, we have fellowship with one another... And the blood of Jesus is some purifies us from all sin. Well, you might be asking, well, what does that mean to walk in the light? Oh, well, Franco, I'm, asking, I'm glad you asked. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves that the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Hmm. So what does this say, Franco? I gotta walk in the light. Yeah, this is the first step, Frank, in making sure when that sin is when that sin wall is gone, that it stays gone. As you walk in the light, you remain open about what's going on in your life. You confess your sins on a regular basis. I got together today, I had three phone calls between the time that I got home and the time that I got here, and I got open about some of the things that were going on in my heart and my life that I needed to walk. Together as a brother, but it was awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Otherwise, what happens is we get bitter and resentful, and these things just pile up within us, and we begin to push away from God. Wow. We gotta, we gotta eliminate that. This is why we confess. So then we go back. We won't do it now. We go back to Galatians five. And what I typically do is we've got you know typically three guys in the Bible study myself, two other guys. And then the person who we're studying with, and I was like, all right, 
So each of us who are disciples are going to go around. We're just going to pick our top three. Not all of them. Not all of them. Just pick your top three. And all of us should have these in our back pocket. This should be like a no-brainer. I know for a fact what my top three were. Period. And so I'm going to share. And I'm going to share the worst of the worst. Because i got to model the way. If I'm going to be open, and I'm going to help this new brother or sister be open, then I'm going to go all out. And it creates an atmosphere of trust. Not, not an atmosphere of like, like manipulated trust, but like legit trust. I want this person to help. I want to help this person become a disciple. I want to help this person walk in the light. So I'm going to share where my sin. And so we go around. And then have that person share last. Top three, that's it. <coughs> now, let's go to Romans chapter 6. After that, we hop right into Romans 6. We'll zip through the rest of this. Come on, bro. Romans 6, look here at verse 23. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the earth. Romans 6, not Romans 3. Romans 6. Although that's a good one too. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's put all this together. Wages of sin, gift of God. What are the wages of sin? Death. Darkness. Hell. What's the gift of God? Life. Not just life on earth, but eternal. Light. Consequences. What are wages? Well, wages are what you work for. Exactly. You get paid fifteen dollars an hour. That's your wage. What's the wages of sin? Death. One way or the other, Franco, you gotta die. One way or the other, you gotta die. That'll make a little bit more sense when we get into the light portion here next. But one way or the other, your sin requires you to die. Let's look at the light. Let's go to John chapter three. John chapter 3. We've already looked at this passage, so it should be pretty familiar to you. Look here in verse 1. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked, Surely they cannot enter a second time of their mother's womb to be born. He has answered very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. Now, what a lot of people try to say about this passage is, oh, well, they're talking about this, this water portion is talking about the, the, when somebody, when the woman's water breaks. And so it can't be talking about what we're going to get into next, which is baptism. Well, that kind of flies in the face of what Jesus is saying because it's saying flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. Mm -hmm. This is a spiritual rebirth, not a physical rebirth. Even the issue that Nicodemus had about going back into his mother's womb to be born. Mm -hmm. Like, this isn't a physical spirit. This isn't a physical rebirth. This is a spiritual rebirth. You would have to be born again. Born of water and spirit. The second thing that this teaches us is this is an adult decision. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is an adult decision. You're born again as an adult. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, look here at verse 22. Now it's important that we believe certain things in order to be in the light. Acts 2, look here at verse 22. We have to believe three essential things in order to be in the light, in order to be saved. 
Verse 22, Acts 2, 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Now, I love this because in these three verses, we have the three things that are necessary to believe, to have deep conviction about, in order for us to be saved. Number one is that Jesus is from God. Jesus came from God. Number two, that's verse 22. Number two in verse 23, everyone is responsible for his death. Notice he said, you with the help of wicked men. Everyone is responsible. Remember what we just read in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. You have to believe that you are responsible for the death of Jesus. Right. Do you believe that, Frank? Absolutely. Amen. And number three in verse 24, that Jesus rose physically from the dead. Some people believe that it was some ethereal, spiritual resurrection. No, no, no. He actually died physically. He actually resurrected physically. You have to believe that. Mm. Now, after you believe these things, what should your response be? Well, let's keep going in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Just to, like, drive it home, Peter just lays it out again and say, you crucified Jesus. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? So what should your response be, Franco, to this news that you killed Jesus? i got to be cut to the heart. What does that mean? Well, you guys use this word convicted a lot. Yeah, but what does that mean? I should feel, I should feel something about this. You should feel remorse. You should feel guilt. You should feel shame. You should feel terrible that you killed Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Oh, oh. And, and I do. They were cut to the heart and said, what do I got to do to get out of this mess? Mm. Whatever it is, just tell me what I got to do. Well, what do we have to do? Verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, about 3,000 were happy their number that day. So once the people believed, what did they do? Well, first of all, they were called to repent. That word repentance in the Greek means to turn. It's metanoia. It's to change your mind that changes your behavior. It's not just a change of behavior. You actually have a new conviction about what is right and what is wrong. And you're walking in the right way. And that's repentance. By the way, repentance and confession are the ways in which that wall stays away. Then you baptized. In the Greek, this is immersed. So can you sprinkle and be saved? No. No. Is this a, a like a spiritual baptism? No. This is a physical immersion. Remember? Water and spirit. Right. You are immersed in water. And we'll get into that in just a second. Right? No. At that point, your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. This is the point that a person is saved. Now, what would happen, Franco... If I just repented but didn't get baptized, am I saved? No. no. What if I got baptized but never repented? Am I saved? No. That's what happened to me when I was 13. Went to camp. My sister had gotten baptized. I'd watched my sister get baptized. My brother had gotten baptized at the camp. I didn't want to get baptized at the camp. I wanted my dad to baptize me. <laughs> For whatever reason, I remember. And so we went back, and a couple days later, I put on this blue robe, and I got into this warm water, and dunked me and that was it. Yet, I got into more sin after getting baptized at 13 than I ever did beforehand. Wow. Why was there no life change? Nobody taught me that I needed to repent. Nobody taught me what I needed to repent of. I definitely didn't get taught what it meant to be a disciple. 
And yet I grew up in a very traditional mainline faith that actually believes that salvation comes from baptism and repentance. But nobody taught me anything else. Come on, bro. And so because I didn't have that faith, guess what? All it was was just a dunk and walk. Mm. That was it. No life changed whatsoever. And so when I was confronted with the reality of the truth, I was like, that's why it didn't stick. That's why I never got the Holy Spirit. Because here's what happens, guys. The, the water washes your sins away. When your sins are gone, now the Holy Spirit can reside inside of you. That's why the process said, repent, be baptized, name it, describe for your sins, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit can't come inside of you if you are not holy. Hence, Holy Spirit. Right? right? So those sins got to go away, and then the Holy Spirit can come and reside inside of you. Amen? Now, let's drive this home a little bit. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And again, come on Wednesday, we're going to dive into this idea quite a bit deeper. And we're going to get into some false doctrines. And I've already kind of touched on a few false doctrines here and there. But for the most part, we're going to dive into that quite a bit more on Wednesday next week. Romans chapter 6, look at verse 1. This sealed the deal for me, guys. Romans chapter 6, verse says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so the grace may increase? Here's what's been happening. There were disciples in the Roman church who were like, Well, if, if God gets more glory the more that I sin, why don't I give God more glory by sinning more? And Paul's like, What? He says, By no means. You died to sin. How can you live in it any longer? And he goes, and qualifies what he means by they died to sin. He says this, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? By the way, that word baptized is the same as in Acts 2.38. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So here's what this is. Jesus... Should have been using purple the whole time. Jesus is on the cross. He died. And he was buried. And then he rose to a new life. Would you agree with that? Remember, we had to believe that, right? He resurrected. Now, what is Paul saying here in Romans? He's saying that we, we died with Christ. Right? That's what we just got through reading. And then we are buried with him in baptism. And then we too may live. So if I don't participate, and that's what baptism is. It's a participation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If I don't participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, can I live a new life? No. No. I can't. And again, we'll dive into some of the false doctrines around other... Um, other things, people say, well, what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that? We'll dive into all those things on Wednesday. Nice. Okay? Um, and it's actually extremely helpful. The Bible has answers for all these things. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. So this, Franco, is why you need to get baptized. Because when you make that decision to die with Christ, you go under those waters of baptism. It's not... It's not the water that's anything. Remember in Romans 3, it's faith in his blood. 
That blood washes your sins away. Once those sins are gone, that Holy Spirit can come and live inside of you. And it can empower you. It will empower you to live this new life. See, what's right now, what's crazy, Franco, is you may be making all these awesome changes in your life. You've been doing that on your own. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you empowering. Think about what you can do with the Holy Spirit inside of you. specific on the way that I want this done. Because there's a method to the madness. Okay? Now, you won't find any biblical passages that says, thou shalt write a letter to God. But we did walk through two passages about walking the light. Is it important enough, Franco, for you just to get open about three things? Or should you, like, walk fully in the light? The Bible says, in him there's no darkness at all. So if you're holding anything back, and you get baptized, is there going to be a problem with that? Yeah, no. absolutely. So I want to give you an opportunity to walk completely in the light. I will typically go write this write this passage down to uh, first. Um, I'll get into this. I typically get into this passage in the church study, but sometimes I get into it here or the, uh, the cross study. Uh, actually, let's go there. Let's go there. First Peter. First Peter. Chapter. Three. Well, bro. Don't worry, we're wrapping it up. First Peter chapter three. Um. So yeah, I'll, I'll write it here. So First Peter chapter three. Look here. Look here in verse twenty-one. And this water. Okay. Well. We're starting a verse in the middle of a sentence. Can we do that? We can do that, but let's get a little context. Okay, let's go up to verse 19. Actually, let's go all the way up to verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Guess what? That's exactly what happens to you when you participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. So Peter, by the way, who wrote, and who didn't write it, but he said, Acts 2.38, that's Peter that was speaking, is talking about this here. He says, and this water, what water? The water that washed the sins away from the world in the days of Noah. For those of you who don't know, right? Noah built an ark, yeah. right? And only eight people, just his family, were saved. What did that God do? God flooded the earth mm -hmm. and literally washed the sins away from the earth. That's the analogy that Peter is painting here. And he says, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers and submission. So baptism does save us. But again, it's not the water. It's not a removal of dirt from body. It's the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. If somebody were to get open about their sin but intentionally hold something back, is that, does that person, when they're standing in the waters of baptism, do they have a clear conscience? No. So is that baptism legitimate? No. no. Because they've got to have a clear conscience towards God. Right. Now, that's not to say, and I said about with a guy a long time ago in San Jose, and he got open, it was wonderful, uh, baptized him, in fact, we studied, Ariel and I studied with he and his wife, and they both, he, I, we, me and his son baptized him, and then he got up, he and his son baptized his mom and wife, and it was awesome, it was glorious. Mm -hmm. So he was in a light and darkness study several months later, 
Somebody in that light and darkness study confessed some sin, and he's like, wow, I did that too. I never confessed that to me. Does that mean now his baptism is invalid? No. Because he wasn't intentionally holding on to it. And so what did he do? Hey, bro, that just reminded me. I did that to my seat. Remember what's And that was it. Not you. We've got to go into those waters of baptism for clear conscience. Mm. And I'm telling you, the way in which I lay out how to do this letter to God is both intentional and it has actually a really awesome way to connect with God. So when I tell the person, and I will literally draw this on the notes, Dear God, or whatever you salutation you give to God, hey God, yo God. What up, God? <laughs> right? And then you're just going to write, thank you for these Bible studies. This is awesome. Eric's mm. a super cool dude. Oh. I'm learning a lot from No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, just obviously, it's, you're, you're, you're grateful for what God's teaching you in these studies, the, the changes that he's allowed to happen, the, the, the epiphanies you've been able to have about the word of God, the closeness to him, the fellowship, the brotherhood, whatever God puts on your heart, whatever it's on your heart to share with God, it's an opportunity to write a letter to him. Uh, no Somewhere in there, you're going to want to just kind of transition to, I want to get open with you, God, about my sin. Mm -hmm. Even though you already know it, I want to write this because I want to have a clear conscience. Mm -hmm. wow. And so what do we do? We go back to Galatians 5.19, and I start writing sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I pause. God, bring to mind anything and everything you want me to remember in this category. I tell you what, I can go boom, 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 boom. And I can write stuff out. We're not reliving experiences. We're just being pretty factual here. Amen? Okay? Amen. There's no need for you to, you know, go crazy with this. Uh, you know, some of our imaginations can run away with us. Let's not go there. But I'd be like, doom, doom, boom, boom, boom. Right? And you're just going to write. Right? However long it takes for you to have that clear conscience. Don't get stuck in the story. Don't get stuck in the narrative. Just write. And then I'm going to pause when I'm done. God, anything else? Jesus, I want to have a clear conscience. Anything else that he brings up? Once you're done, next. Get pure. Pray, God. Please bring. Literally, I'm pausing at each one. Guys, I do this every year. I skipped last year. I don't know why I skipped it. But I, I do this every year, even to this day, with sins that I've committed across the year. Even though I've already forgiven them. It's just a good therapeutic process to get close to them. Uh, and be grateful for the cause, yeah. which is the next study we're going to do. Or study after that. Right? And I just literally walk down the list. Now, Galatians 5 is the big one to walk through. Although, if you're like me, one of my big sins was at the end of that uh, Timothy passage which says, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And I will write all the ways that I've had a form of godliness because I grew up religious. Yeah. I grew up claiming to be a Christian. I grew up going, I'm a great Christian. And I would tout, you know, Christianity from the rooftops. And yet, I was living in sin. Yeah. I was a hypocrite. I'm not building these kind of things. Right? So that's something that's a big one for me. But maybe lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Maybe it was disobedient to your parents. Maybe it's unright... Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, unholy. Maybe it's a rash, which is making quick decisions without thinking about it. Maybe it's abusive, conceited. What, whatever those sins of the heart was, then, then guess what? Your sin list is going to be a bit longer. But again, what's the point and purpose of that? Clear conscience towards God. And so I end with, God, thank you for the opportunity to study the Bible. Thank you that I'm going to be free of these sins very, very soon. God, thank you, thank you, thank you, you know, and then I love you Amen. 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 Awesome. The, the challenge is then for them to bring that letter back with them to the cross study. Where they have this letter in front of them as we walk through the cross. And they get to see what did Jesus go through for that stack of people. Man, that's powerful. Amen. Amen. And that is, my brothers and sisters, the L&D study. Woo!